microphone in may go away okay so uh, i'll continue uh, so in the intro section we're going to define the greenwashing because uh, we need to we need to share some understanding about this kind of new world and then i'm going to briefly introduce myself and then uh, list some of the examples of greenwashing and in fact today uh, many of you may have a totally different uh, perspective about recycled and recycling although it seems that the general public uh, seem to think that this is the way to go to protect the environment and uh, this is almost a virtue because a lot of uh, big brands I don't have to name these brands because uh, most of them do this, but uh, uh, they advertise the recycled content and things like that. But we need to understand what's behind the recycling. So I'm going to share some perspectives based on my experiences and knowledge in the industry. And then we're going to talk about the Green Recycling Initiative. And uh, this is the uh, most sustainable technology platform that uh, there is in the market. It's not just what I'm saying. It's uh, being uh, certified uh, with a, 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 a third-party audit program, uh, which is underway at the moment. So I'll share more information about that. And then Q&A section. So definitions, according to Cambridge Dictionary, is to make people believe that your company is doing more to protect the environment than it, 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 than it really is. An attempt to make people believe that your company is doing more to protect the environment than it really is. An attempt to make your business seem interested in protecting the natural environment when it is not. So these are the uh, literal definitions of it. And I personally wanted to add um, this comparison, knowingly and unknowingly. Um, there can be a lot of corporate activities that lead to disadvantages or even harm for the consumers and general public. And it's, if it's knowingly done, it's uh, a dishonest and the greed. In fact, there was a, a, a book written about the corporate misbehaviors and there have been so many examples of these um, and uh, we only find out the impact of these these activities from even some of the largest companies only several years after the uh, the activities uh, start happening and then uh, only if it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, figured out by the public then they are finger pointed and once again, we have a lot of examples of that. And if it's done unknowingly, it would be a lack of ability. Whether it's uh, they're not focused or they're lazy, they're not properly trained, whatnot. In the end, if these activities or these behaviors are understood by the public, uh, they may say sorry. But is the sorry enough? That's the thing. So, my definition about greenwashing is the lack of full disclosure of the information. There has to be a transparency, especially for the environment, because it's not just the environment for one company or several large companies. It's the environment for everybody. So, me, the way I look at it is this. Even if the performance of a environmental activity is not that great sorry I made a mistake with uh, the animation so let me delete this and then I'll go back so even if a performance is not the best if uh, if if they share all the um, information with us and if they leave us with an opportunity to figure things out and uh, improve upon it together as a society then it's okay but if they don't 
give a full disclosure, then it is it can be described as greenwashing. So I will give you a really, really bad example. I titled it as, is this for real? Because this is one of the worst examples that I've seen. So this uh, large global fashion company was advertising uh, to bring uh, the garments that uh, that uh, consumers don't want and bring it to their stores and then put it in the recycling bins and uh, we'll chop it up and uh, use it as insulation. And in the perspectives of uh, people who do not understand what goes behind, this seemed to make sense. However, as a person who understands what goes behind with a process like this, basically they're saying, use the garments, we'll chop it up, and then use it as an insulation material that goes inside the garment. But along with the chopping and slicing and cutting all these, invariably you have a lot of dust created. And also, as a, a person who also specialize in thermal insulation technologies, you can see how a properly constructed thermal insulation material look like. It's not a collection of dust or chopped up fibers. It is not. You have to have a proper construction. So this is not technically viable uh, solution. And also, what about this? If anybody can bring in the garments or textile goods that they don't want and put it in the recycling bins, what about the dust mites, bed bugs, and bacteria, all kinds of uh, living organisms that might be included in there? And in fact, there has been a manifestation of uh, bed bugs and, um, and uh, cockroaches and stuff like that in the city that I uh, live in, uh, which is Montreal. And if uh, anybody from Montreal brings their own clothes and then put it in the recycling bin, there is a good chance that it may include these uh, microorganisms. Now, one thing that I have noticed from the company's uh, literature is they say, well, we'll select suitable you know, garments and then we'll use that as an insulation material. But what does that mean, select? The real viable way of selecting it would be that every inch of used garments you have to go through with a microscope and see if there are living organisms or not. And can that be done in a mass production? No, it cannot be done. And uh, as far as I know, there is no um, large scale uh, method to be able to detect these and sort uh, those that are uh, infected. So. Like saying something like that may give a false impression for the donators or people who believe in this kind of program, a false sense of security when there isn't. So is this a greenwashing in the definition? To me, it is a definite greenwashing because consumers are not made aware of the information that's behind that short description of bring your garments in and we'll recycle it as insulation. So that was a bad example. And what about recycling and recycled, biodegradable and these big keywords? So that's where the Clean Recycling Initiative comes in. So before I go further, I'd like to briefly introduce myself. I'm, the, um, I'm running the Clean Recycling Initiative as a nonprofit organization. And I also run a for-profit organization called Heatmax. I'm a textile engineer. And uh, before I established Heatmax Business and Clean Recycling Initiative, I uh, managed um, the sales activities of 3M Dinsulate, Scotchlight, and Scotchgard based in Montreal. And I created and invented all the products and technologies under Heatmax brand. And I decided to donate the uh, technologies of uh, Clean Recycling Initiative to the nonprofit organization Clean Recycling Initiative. And then I have so a few other uh, credentials. Uh, if uh, you have LinkedIn uh, account, uh, please uh, connect with me. Uh, I, it would be really big pleasure for me to get to know you online. Now, let's look at the recycled and recycling 
like I said, most brand companies, textile companies, uh, now drive their sustainable uh, technologies with this recycled or recycling uh, business. Now, until 2017, China was the heart of the global plastic wastes. Then, all of a sudden, they banned the importation of the plastic waste. And it seemed really sudden in uh, the rest of the world because we had to deal with the garbage crisis everywhere around the world. But it actually started, Chinese government started uh, implementing some measures to, to reduce and finally uh, ban the importation of the plastic waste. And then other uh, countries follow the suit. So, since then, there have been so many other countries in Asia, uh, South America, and, and Africa uh, who banned the importation of, uh, of uh, plastic waste. Now, there is a gap, really big gap between what these uh, textile companies in Western world are doing, meaning that they are pushing recycled or recycling as their green technologies and what these manufacturing hubs of these materials are doing, meaning banning these materials. So there is a gap. Why? What's the missing puzzle? So that's what we're going to share with you today. If you look at the, the, the ways the recycling is done, uh, basically there is a collecting, um, a collection and transportation and uh, a lot of other activities are involved. And uh, the way we at Clean Recycling Initiative see it is there are three major sources of negative impact that are created because of the recycling, the way it's done right now. Number one, transportation. Number two, crushing and grinding. Number three, dying. Now, I will not have time to cover all of these um, uh, today in one hour live uh, stream but if you visit our YouTube channel uh, you can do a keyword search clean recycling initiative there are six videos from module 1 to module 6 which cover um, all these uh, big uh, problematic areas uh, that cre that is created that creates the uh, the negative impact now I will cover uh, the number two section because that is really graphic uh, and uh, I have some videos to share with you. Number four, fiber strength and microplastics during the whole life cycle of recycled goods. So I'll explain this a bit further uh, in the later, par the later part and the colors, colors, colors. Also, I will cover that as well. So when I say crushing and grinding, it this process creates a lot of microplastics and it contaminates our water system. So this is one of the video uh, clips uh, that I have that shows the crushing and grinding process. In fact, uh, this, uh, uh, this machine here behind, there is a big enough motor to fly uh, a mid-size airplane. So what it happens when you uh, throw the plastics away, it goes through a certain type of uh, sorting process and then it goes through a really big uh, grinder basically which crushes crushes all the plastics and make into the small uh, bits and pieces and from that it creates a lot of microplastics and the microplastics uh, in the water system water system flows freely through the ocean system and this is why not in my backyard does not work. Where, wherever this happens, it directly impacts us. Okay, so you, I did not cover all the uh, problems of the uh, current ways of recycling, but if these big uh, textile uh, brands, if they do not share these pictures with the public, is it greenwashing? To me, it is, because if this is the type of information the consumers have to know why, I'll explain to you the healthy effect of the microplastics that are created uh, 
like these processes. I'm not sure if you are aware of the, the, the fact that most of the food that we consume today, it's, it's uh, contaminated with microplastics. It's not what Sei Chang says. It's uh, according to World Wildlife Federation who says it took you up to one week to eat one credit card means uh, you consume enough microplastics and if you add it up it will weigh as as much as a, a credit card that you have in your wallet that's an incredibly high quantity and microplastics are found in 90 percent of bottled water around around the world now this was done this survey was done maybe about 10 years ago so this proportion would be higher today beer on average has 4.05 man-made particles mostly plastic fibers per liter and there are many different sources of microplastics even the laundry uh, that you do creates a lot of microplastics from the synthetic fibers or microparticles from the natural fibers now these we cannot avoid because we have to we have to wash our uh, clothes and stuff like that but it is happening from the recycling process under the name of sustainability that is a main issue that i'm having and when you consume that much microplastics uh, what can happen i'm not saying it will happen to you what can happen not say Chang who says this but Rachel Adams in fact let me put a little Rachel Adams uh, is a senior uh, lecturer in biomedical science at the uh, Cardiff Metropolitan University she says that uh, it can be the uh, coagulation center of the um, Met the uh, toxic material like mercury, uh, pesticides, dioxin in your body. Sometimes it can create uh, inflammations, can give you headaches, but they can also create a cancer in your body. So this certainly is not something that you want to uh, consume in large quantities. So when the consumers are not aware of uh, this kind of information, when a company says oh our uh, recycled content is 30 percent 40 percent whatever that number may be is it greenwashing to me it is it is a greenwashing and let's look at the fiber strength and uh, what it impacts in the uh, uh, life uh, life uh, circle of the uh, recycled fibers so when sorry let me uh, do this again when we collect recycle recycling uh, plastics it comes with a lot of contaminants and those contaminants affect the strength of the raw material fibers starting from the fibers and the fabrics and it weakens basically the the fabrics and the textile goods that you you use a lot of times I see the recycled or recycling uh, being linked to circular economy uh, by many different uh, textile companies but when you have this much contamination in the um, fiber making you cannot make it circular in fact if you can uh, recycle only once for this kind of kind of process that is that is more than sufficient in terms of maintaining the fiber strength so it's really not a circular economy so is there an element of greenwashing in this picture as well yes there is because the fibers made of recycled uh, processes they will continually shed uh, microplastics a lot easier than the goods made of virgin fibers so there is a green uh, an element of greenwashing colors and colors colors now this is a list of a one particular chemical company that they uh, that they sell for the dyeing processes fabric dyeing or the fiber dyeing and there are so many different uh, chemicals and
and uh, it's uh, it would be really time consuming to try to understand what the chemical composition of each of these chemicals are but we don't have to do that because we know that things like this happens in the manufacturing hub of textile goods in fact uh, I grew up in Korea in um, 1970s and 1980s and uh, Korea was quite poor at that time and I saw some of this in my neighborhood so um, as the living standards uh, became higher in Korea these things uh, you know migrated to other countries but as I showed you earlier the water flows without any borders so whether this happens in Bangladesh or in my backyard uh, it still affects us one way or another and is there a, a big element of greenwashing yes there is so if I were to use recycled uh, garment I want to buy this brand because they are advertising recycled content so on and so forth without all these full disclosure of what's happening behind is that greenwashing I think that it is and these days I see this um, these two words quite uh, quite often biodegradable biodegradability and a lot of people misunderstand bioplastics or uh, what should I say compostable uh, plastics as biodegradable products there are some complex uh, scientific data behind it scientific uh, facts behind it and uh, for general public it may be a little bit difficult to understand but what I want to point out is that there are a lot of what you call degradable plastics or compostable plastics that do not degrade in the real nature so let's say you have landfill close to your house and uh, those bio biodegradable uh, fibers uh, that are claimed by a certain company is it going to uh, naturally degrade into the nature uh, in your uh, neighborhood landfill that there is a big question mark and a lot of evidences have shown that uh, that may not be the case now I am actually showing you some of the the uh, the information references where uh, I took these information so you can actually look it up uh, in Wikipedia you can actually uh, 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 type in biodegradable uh, fibers and you can find uh, find these uh, these uh, excerpts and uh, so it is important how the biodegradability is uh, tested and I'll show you an example of a test method ASTM now I'm showing you this example because a lot of uh, companies which will promote their biodegrad biodegradable products they will simply quote the test method in their effort to try to give some credibility uh, of their claims of being biodegradable but these test methods are titled as biodegradable test but this particular um, test method says not to be used for unqualified biodegradable claims now they specify this because there are so many unqualified biodegradable claims happening and same thing another test method is is uh, uh, making the same thing so let's think about this you have a landfill close to your house which is mostly residential areas and the composition of the household wastes can be quite different from a site where mostly it's uh, companies or industrial sites so the chemical compositions and the temperature that goes inside can be widely different now as far as I understand 
There are a lot of test methods that are designed to determine whether a synthetic uh, material is compostable under a certain uh, condition, including the temperature, chemical composition, and the pressure. And uh, those conditions are met in the manufacturing facilities where a big equipment is designed to create those types of elements. And as I said, the household uh, waste versus industrial waste may have a totally different chemical compositions. I haven't uh, seen uh, a test method that can cover these different uh, uh, variables. So we really have to uh, give a, a strong caution when you see this type of uh, claims. And especially I have seen a company that uh, claims biodegradable insulation material. So meaning that the insulation material goes inside the garments between the shell fabric and lining fabric. And is there a test method that gives you um, that gives you the conditions like the the finished garments being discarded and uh, put in the landfill with all kinds of chemical treatments like dyes, waterproof, uh, water repellent, uh, seam sealing, and all of these uh, elements of the uh, the textile goods. Uh, is there any test method to determine the biodegradability of the insulation material that is deep inside the gar garment? I haven't seen it. If uh, there is anybody who knows this type of test method, please let me know. So, is there an element of wind washing here? Definitely there is. In fact, uh, I have not seen any test method actually. It's some test methods, uh, it's really difficult even to obtain. So if you are a, a um, just a regular consumer, not in the textile industry, you don't have a PhD degree in the uh, chemistry, it may be very difficult to even read through these uh, test methods. Uh, first of all, it's very hard to obtain it. And uh, some of the uh, deep digging that I've done, although the title may lead you to believe that, oh, this may be happening in the real environment if it passes this test method, then uh, when you read the f uh, fine lines, uh, it was not the case in a lot of cases. So, so those are the uh, things that uh, I um, talked about in terms of uh, greenwashing. But I'm not fixated with the greenwashing. What I'm fixated is about why the cooperative misbehaviors of not either not doing their research properly or giving the whole uh, consequences uh, to the general public to deal with, that is a big issue that I have. Some of the biggest companies in the textile industry, the apparel brands and uh, outdoor brands, um, they just publish the content of recycling or recycled material without sharing the background information. So that is a big issue. So at the Clean Recycling Initiative, we're trying to break that through. And um, what has happened uh, in my career um, of running Heatmax as a company that specializes in thermal insulation technologies, we um, we made uh, we established this uh, clean recycling initiative uh, technology platforms, and I wanted to uh, use it as an open source textile program that anybody can uh, join in and uh, make improvements. And I wanted to make it also as a nonprofit so that uh, even my competitors can benefit from uh, from these technical developments and benefit is uh, essentially for the public. So that's what uh, we are aimed to do at Clean Recycling Initiative. So let me go back to the Clean Recycling Initiative uh, based on the current ways of doing recycling. Uh, and with the Clean Recycling Initiative, we'll have uh, three different sources of textile wastes and we'll have different levels uh, of uh, Clean Recycling Initiative. 
and uh, transportation wise will make it much more efficient than the current ways because we do a lot of local processing and uh, make shipment with the smallest and the, the most dense um, form of uh, textile raw material and will eliminate crushing grinding altogether and will also eliminate dyeing altogether we will use the method of melting because that does not create the microplastics so if you look at the the technology categories of clean recycling initiative there's level one also called post-consumption method level two pre-consumption method level three is inline method inline method is when we produce our non-woven thermal insulation material we sell the part in the middle because that's the most consistent quality of the goods and then we s we ship it to the factories that make the finished goods like apparel pillows and so on and so forth and then what happens with the edge material before we establish this uh, inline method it used to be an industrial garbage but heat heat max developed the technology that will allow us to put this edge material right to the beginning of this whole process so that the material does not even have to leave the factory space to be reused. This is the most sustainable technology platform because it does not even create a single trace of even carbon footprint. So because we use the melting method, there is no microplastics and there is no dyeing or any other chemical use. And uh, like I said, there is no carbon footprint. In fact, uh, we uh, have a little bit of carbon footprint because uh, when we uh, move uh, uh, the edge material to the back of the, the, pro the to the beginning of the process, uh, sometimes we use a uh, fork lane but uh, we are actually in the process of eliminating altogether by using conveyor belt and different process. So once again, there is not going to be even a single trace of carbon footprint with this. So I can safely say that this is the most efficient and the most sustainable technology uh, in, the, in the global textile industry. And if you look at the pre-consumption method, this involves every player in the uh, textile industry so whether you are a brand or manufacturer or distributor or retailer you can all participate in this pre-consumption method now one of the biggest ways that you can uh, you can participate is that uh, the factories that you work with whether it's your own factory or contracted out factory we can go in there and then we can collect the textile left outs from the fabrics from the cutouts we can actually put that through in our melting uh, process these material are clean material so there, there is no dirt cleaning or anything uh, no chemical uh, cleaning that we need to do we can simply collect these and then put it through the melting process and of course you know uh, that uh, the, the different colors are involved because uh, each uh, line in a factory can have a different colors of uh, leftover fabrics and all that it doesn't matter because we're going to uh, put it through the melting process and we're going to use it as thermal insulation material and the thermal insulation material it goes inside the uh, shell fabric lining fabric and other elements of the uh, uh, the making and so there is no need for us to worry about the color at all and so this is going to be the essence of uh, level two and uh, it was just saying that uh, different colors are okay and uh, once again uh, we're using it now important factors in this case is sorting 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 if we put the same groups of uh, of uh, uh, fabrics together meaning 
100% polyester, 100% nylon, 100% polypropylene. We can do this job very, very easy. And it will give some financial benefits for the factories as well. Uh, now, it, it, right now, we don't have the, the actual uh, implementation of uh, blended fabrics as of now, but uh, we're working on it right now in order to develop a, a sustainable solution for the uh, blended fabrics as well. But there is still a lot of 100% um, homogeneous fabrics that we can uh, s start recycling in a cl clean way. And that will be a good start. And then we're hoping to uh, make an improvement to include the blended fabrics with uh, 100% synthetic uh, compositions or the uh, the natural even natural uh, contents. Now, co post composition, this is um, a little bit way out for us because we need to work with our local uh, governments and uh, establish the collection system and things like that. But there is more than tr one trillion uh, pieces of textile goods around the world. If they all have to be uh, burnt or um, uh, put in the landfills, it would be a really, really bad, uh, bad thing. By the way, w one of the video modules, uh, I think it's video module two of our Clean Recycling Initiative YouTube channel, you can see what really happens with the, the garments that you put out in the uh, local recycling bins. Are they really recycled? Reality is it's not. Uh, most of them get shipped to Africa somewhere and the, even the Canadian winter coats get shipped there and then it gets burned there or uh, put it as a, a as a landfill so right now the situation is really really bad in fact I don't know why the whole society is so focusing on the pr uh, plastic recycling when we have much much bigger issue with the textile waste because textile waste unlike the plastic most of the plastic waste it contains chemicals that are toxic dyes and bleach and a lot of other chemicals that are used for the manufacturing of the textile goods it all leaks into the environment whether you incinerate it or you put it in the as a as a landfill it will leak into the environment for a long long period of time so it if I was go going to decide the priority between plastics and the textile wastes it would be the textile waste now, there has not been a really good, valid uh, program for this, but the uh, um, Clean Recycling Initiative is committed to, uh, to envelop all of the ecosystem of the textile uh, from the manufacturing to the consumption and will try to find the best possible solution. It's going to be a painstakingly uh, difficult process especially for the level one. Level two, level three is fairly simple. We c if you're interested, we can implement it today if you are working for a textile company, if you are from a brand, we can actually implement it very, very quickly. However, post consumption method, it may take a little bit more time. Now, please visit our Clean Recycling Initiative YouTube channel. There, you'll have a very interesting information about uh, the textile uh, waste and uh, the current ways of uh, recycling. And uh, you will get, these are very simple information that anybody and everybody can relate to and uh, can easily understand. So um, module one will deal with uh, uh, how the recycling, in, recycling is done right uh, uh, these days and how bad it can be for the environment and num uh, module number two deals with the uh, uh, current situation of the textile waste and the big gap between uh, what people think when they put it in the recycling bin versus what happens with those and uh, a lot of other interesting contents are there while you're there if you uh, want to become a member for the Clean Recycling Initiative. For the individuals, it's free of charge. And for the corporates, we actually charge a small amount as a membership due for us to be able to um, promote these uh, and implement these uh, important activities uh, cost effectively. So that is there. In fact, uh, I think our website for the membership is not uh, functioning right now. We're trying to uh, fix it right away. So please check back. Uh, to see if uh, it works uh, in the coming 
uh, days or weeks. And uh, as the last uh, part, I'd like to uh, mention that if you are from uh, the textile industry, uh, please note that uh, my for-profit business, uh, Hidmax, offers COVID-19 virtual assistance program. I'm promoting this because uh, all the Hidmax's products and technologies are based on the Clean Recycling Initiative. And uh, by understanding what uh, Hidmax's products do, you will also have a chance to understand uh, how it contributes to the benefit of not only the environment but also for the uh, for the um, performance of your goods as well and uh, basically anybody who relates to these industry segments uh, you can you can uh, join in uh, if you sign up our um, email list uh, we can certainly uh, we can certainly let you know the future uh, webinars that we uh, we do in the future uh, also the uh, live streams on YouTube that we do uh, so that is what I prepared today uh, today I have shared a lot of uh, information and uh, some of this information may be a little bit overwhelming to you uh, depending on your professional background or uh, whatnot uh, but uh, please don't worry because we're going to do this uh, routinely and uh, in the coming sessions, we might just do a Q&A and you can join in our live streams and then we can just chat about the environment and the textiles if you are interested. Uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed this content. And uh, once again, I really appreciate your time. And let's keep in touch. Uh, please say hi. You can send me an email. You can call me. And uh, let me know what your thoughts are in terms of... Uh, in terms of uh, greenwashing uh, and uh, the corporate activities. That's it for now. So, Kyungyeon, is there any question? No, there's no question. Okay, so I'll end uh, this live stream. Thank you again. Have a great day.